I usually need to mute what I'm talking about. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. You are the um, only member of the CSSJC um, that's here right now. We'll check to see if there are folks in the attendees. I don't know if it's my internet or yours. Well, I'm pretty sure it's mine. That was very distorted. <laughs> so um, I, I'll i repeat what I was saying that, oh, well, the other members of the CSSJC are just lo logging on. Um, at first, you were the only member. Can you hear me clearly, clearly now? Yes, I can. Thank you. Great. Right. And we I did see Lisette in the attendees, so we'll need to move her over. Okay. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Deborah. Hi. Hello. No, everyone else. No. Allegra hasn't joined yet. No, she has not. All right. Let me text her. Alice, can you check the participants to see if? If not, then, um, Pamela, do you have the script that I'm supposed to read in terms of the fact that we can do it mobile and blah, 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 and all that stuff? I, I do have it. Um, do you have a quorum? Oh, here she is. Here's the library. Oh, here's the library. There we go. All right. Well, yeah, no, I would wait until we have a quorum, but I'm just saying I would just want to plan B if we needed to. <laughs> right, Allegra? Sure. Because <laughs> I wasn't sure if you were going to get on. So I was just wanting to make sure we had the script just in case if I had to. Yes. Uh, sorry, I was having some technical difficulties. Do you want to open if you are? No, no, you can go ahead. I like it. You go ahead. But I'm just saying, you know, probably for the future, it's probably good for me to have the script just in case if ever I need to kind of also do it, you know. That's why we have two. But I like the way we've been handling it so far. That you um, kind of, you know, do all the all the formal techie stuff. <laughs> all right. Well, my apologies for being late. Um, I was having a little difficulty with the technology, but it looks like we have a quorum. Um, so it is. 6:35. This is a meeting of the Community Safety and Social Justice Committee. Um, with the extension of Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to attend the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. Uh, see instructions below. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. We are recording. We are recording. Oh. And um, I'm... I did not see a response to my earlier uh, message that Jennifer's not here to do the tech. So I asked if you could have a member take uh, notes. Yes. Um, would anybody like to take notes or I can do it if um, the only thing I would ask is that maybe somebody write when I'm speaking, um, if I make any comments, because I forget to do that when I'm talking myself. But we also have the video for our backup, so I can I can write notes, and my own comments might not be included in it. And Allegra, you're freezing. Well, you're you're now back with us, but you were frozen for a minute. So okay, um, I can take notes, and we have the recording as a backup, um, just because sometimes I forget to write when I speak. <laughs> so if I remember, I'll I'll right when you're speaking <laughs> oh, perfect teamwork makes the dream work exactly. um so just to make sure we can hear everyone and i know is isabella is um studying abroad right now so she is trying to join us but she's not sure if her internet connection is stable right now um so just we can hear deb and deb can hear us everald can you hear us um i can yes perfect thank you and lisette can you hear us Hi. Yes, I can. That's all the business part of it. So just to go over the agenda for tonight, 
uh, we'll have announcements, public comment, member reports, then on to the action and discussion items, which include the CREST DEI youth empowerment updates, the resident oversight board update, a debrief from the forums that we held back in November and December, um, the police chief and CREST director search updates, clinical support options in the budget letter, um, and then an additional public comment and future meeting setting. So let's see. Does anybody have any announcements? Um, well, is I just have the announcement in terms of um, events. Is this the appropriate time for that? Yeah. Okay, so let me just look over here. I know that um, with the Judy Brooks series, Wednesday, uh, February 21st, 2024, well, um, we're going to be at 7 p.m. There's going to be a talk by a panel discussion with members of the Black Business Association of Amherst area. Um, so hopefully lots of folks will um, support and make it to that. Also, I have a um, another one, just bear with me one second, just getting the information because I don't want to get it wrong. There's also going to be an um, HBCU, Historically Black College University's College Tour panel and info session. Um, panelists include alumni from the universities of Hampton, Howard, Morehouse, Spelman, and more. And that's going to be Friday, February 9th. So tomorrow, 6.30 to 8.30, Banks Community Center, 70 Boltwood Walk, Amherst Mass, 01002. Um, and register, you need to register uh, for the event. Um, and then also, I forgot to say, with the, with the Judy Brooks series, that's by Zoom, so you need to register for that too. So just go on the League of Women Voters uh, website. It's the racial justice um, committee that's putting that on. So please um, register for that. Thank you. Um, and just to piggyback off of the HBCU announcement, um, I believe the website is for Club O. It's C-L-U-B-8, C-L-U-B-O-H. Um, and I think there's a registration for that as well on their website. And my understanding is it's also an info session for the um, tour that they do over April vacation week to go down to visit some of the HBCUs. Um, so there will be some info about that and info yeah. about scholarship and, and stuff like that. And, and just to add to, to what you were saying, Allegra, with the HBCU um, info session, um, even though for the tours for high school students that they're targeting. Mm -hmm. However, um, for the um, information uh, program, you can bring you know kids any age that would be interested. So for instance, my son who's in eighth grade, I'm thinking of bringing him because obviously when he's in high school, that would be a great opportunity for him. So you, you don't have to have high school age um, students in order to go to the info and get them into learning about HBCUs early. Great. Um, does anybody else have any announcements? I have a not fully formed announcement. Um, 80 Acres is an organization run out of Amherst and they have started a free store, um, of like clothing and goods on North Pleasant Street. It has, um, limited hours of operation right now, but I believe that they have some info on their website. Which Can you is, explain further about that? Um, so it is a experience. I can just read what it says on the website. It's an, a living experiment in black liberation. They have a school, they have a law center and they have um, community wellness events and activities. Um, so they ha are a part of what they're trying to do is have things available for community members who might not have access to them otherwise. So like clothing, household goods, that sort of thing. So they are both 
giving things away and, and looking for people who might be able to volunteer to help with um, both donating and distributing things from their free store. And so I believe it is on North Pleasant Street near where their law firm is and that they have um, a few hours during the week that they're open. And I think one Sunday a month that they'll be operating right now. Um, but it's 80acres.org is the website. More announcements from committee members. Pamela, do you want to just give a rundown of any of the upcoming DEI events now so that they don't get lost in the shuffle? I know sometimes they come after the CRESS update, which can... Sure. And I was actually going to suggest that I maybe do the DEI update first. Okay. The entire uh, CRESS leadership team. Um, so uh, so I could just do that all at once if that's okay. Perfect. Yeah. So um, for DEI updates, the um, Black History Month uh, proclamation was read on the first and there are uh, uh, panels which we've uh, titled the African-American Experience in Amherst, which is a local history that's on display in town hall um, and the space that would normally be used for the public arts display. And those panels will be on display throughout the entire month. On the uh, 16th, which is the date that we hold our staff DEI events, the third Friday of, um, of the month, um, uh, staff and, and town are encouraged to do what we're calling um, like uh, excursions. So there are four locations in town that we're highlighting for Black History Month. The panels that are in Town Hall, the Civil War tablets here in the Bangs, Ancestral Bridges at Amherst College, and Jones Library. So um, staff will meet here on the 16th, and then depending on the size of the group, we'll travel as one group or two, and we'll visit two of those locations. Um, which are likely to be the Civil War tablets here in the banks and um, Ancestral Bridges um, as our monthly staff DEI um, event. Um, the DEI uh, department had to cancel the National Day of Racial Healing because that was the day of the storm. That event has been rescheduled for the final event for Black History Month and will occur on the 29th at Crocker Farms from 6 until 8 p.m. And we'll have the Spring Festival or Lunar New Year event on, on the 17th in the middle school. So those are the events that are happening within the month. Um, the Youth Empowerment Survey was distributed. I, it has had a few responses, but there is a real need to push that out again. Unfortunately, we have not continued our relationship with AmeriCorps, so um, ASUS no longer are working with DEI or the um, CREST department. We have received some support from um, faculty at the middle and high school to assist with the youth empowerment survey, and Jennifer and I just need to find a time to um, be actually at the school sites to encourage people to take the survey and get their feedback. So um, the survey was released. It's had a few responses, but there's a need to really um, to push that out again. Uh, the Resident Oversight Board had um, event those public forums. The last one was on the 24th or the 21st, I'm sorry, of January. Um, there have been 72 responses to the survey. Uh, the consultant is preparing a report, and we anticipate that that report will come, you know, sometime in March, right? Um, it's just obviously take some time to review all the responses and draft her draft her report. Uh, 
In other news, the department is sort of just, I would say, as a whole is sort of keeping its head above water, but it's obviously a challenge because um, we no longer have ASA and Jennifer is carrying a lot of the weight of planning these events and activities. We have had some support from CRESS, uh, which was a, a huge support as far as uh, assisting with the uh, uh, Black History Experience panels, both their production and um, with getting those panels uh, on display in the, in the town hall. So I think that's sort of like DEI in uh, a nutshell. And if you have some questions, I'll do my best to try to answer them. Yeah, I have, I have some questions. Um, so I guess with the youth empowerment, um, so right now we're still at, at the point of, you know, the survey. Um, so is there any other kind of parallel um, activities happening there? Which what I mean is, are we still looking for a space? Are we still um, advocating for budget for the youth empowerment center? Um, you know, because I get, getting a survey to figure out programming and so on and so forth. But, you know, we've we're already gone on uh, several years since the recommendations from the CSWG um, around finding a space for the Youth Empowerment Center. Right. So um, the and, okay. and, uh, and also budget. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if you can respond to that. And then I have a couple more questions. Sure. That, so the town manager made a decision that he would lead the um, the efforts to acquire a location. And I think I reported that in the fall. So that's his initiative. So, he, okay. So do you have any updates on his initiative then? I do not. Okay. Is that something that you could get for the next meeting? Sure. A, a update in terms of where that's at. And so he's also handling budget? Well, the two would go hand in hand as far as acquiring the building and, um, providing a budget for whatever programming there would be. Okay, and I'll also send him an email to ask him these questions then since he's the one that's now leading that effort. Yeah, I believe that, that, that I reported that information earlier in the fall that okay. he had decided that he was going to spearhead that with the rec department. Okay, maybe I missed it, I, I, didn't, I didn't hear that. Um, okay, that sounds, um, I'll, I'll follow up with him, but also if you could um, talk with them that, you know, we'd want an update on how things are going um, for the next meeting, but I'll also send him a, an email myself. Um, and then my other question is around the re resident oversight board. Um, you know, I understand that there were these um, sessions going on, but again, you know, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll continue to be the broken record in regards to it which is, um, you know, CSWG, we have made uh, recommendations in terms of putting those, the, the resident oversight board in place like eons ago. Um, and we're still at the stage of, you know, again, listening and, and, and get, gathering information that had already been gathered, information that was already there. Um, so what is the next step? So March is a report. When right. is the actual, board going to be established. That's my interest. And, and I think a lot of the community, especially BIPOC folks interest in terms of a place for them to go and complain about right. what so they're I, not I, happy I, with. So yeah, I mean, you know. So as you stated, the CSWG made recommendations and those recommendations have been under review by the town and the town has made some efforts. As you know, the um, there were efforts to get a consultant to to move this forward uh, last year, and those efforts failed. So then there was a regroup and the, the, another effort to move the consultant. Um, so we had the current conversations. That report um, will be followed by a, an RFP to have a consultant with the expertise to um, establish and train a board. I think that we're still in... Um, in good shape to have a board established before the end of the fiscal year. Um, um, the RFP has already been drafted and is ready to go, but it is waiting the report because uh, the RFP does make mention 
of the prior work that's been done. And that, and, and by prior work, I, I I mean the work of both the current consultant and the uh, S. Um, uh, uh, forgotten the acronym community. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So both of those are are made are referenced in the RFP, uh, and it will be released once we have the other re the most recent report to move that forward. So I I still think that there is a very good possibility that there could be a board established before the end of this fiscal year. That's certainly um, the hope. So, yeah, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying, Pamela, but as you know, I disagreed and, and, and a lot of others disagreed with the way that you all went about things, which was it was basically kind of trying to to do things that were already done in terms of work and consultants that CSWG had hired previously and established the fact that there should have been a resident oversight board. So basically, this whole phase A was, I think, a, a huge waste of time. And then we we should have been already in phase B. So I, I'm I'm just restating what has been stated. I get what you're saying, but I'm just restating what what it is. And in terms of the fact that with all of this time wasted, then the people who are the ones that need this don't have it in place. And so I'm I'm happy to hear though that you're saying that by the end of this fiscal year, which is let me just make sure, and fiscal year that's June. June, um, what is it? Um, how many the end days? of the fiscal year would be June 30th. And I think okay, June 30th. Still, still the very strong likelihood that an RFP would go out, that a consultant would be hired, and that consultant could, could raise up a board by the end of the fiscal year. Okay, so well, I'm going to continue to make sure that this continues to uh, progress, and I'm going to continue the pressure in terms of um, making this happen sooner rather than later. Um, and then uh, lastly, I know there had been, Barbara Love had um, been acquired at some point to do like the, the visioning session. Yeah, she did. Train she the train. did yeah, so she did uh, three full sessions in the fall. Um, and um, it, the, the participants included both members of the community and members of the staff. We have been um, working with that group to have them continue their work by acting as facilitators for some of the other DEI initiatives. And the members who went through that process are scheduled to be facilitators for the National Day of Racial Healing. Okay, so um, is this gonna, so the National Day of Racial Healing is what is going to be the kind of the place where we're going to start building. I thought, you know, in terms of, again, the CSWG recommendations, this was supposed to be a, you know, kind of, you know, impactful, um, you know, process to really get, you know, the town and people involved in going through this, this, this healing process, right? So that there could be more trust within the town and to get people involved, right? And not just the same voices. Um, to have translators in place, to have people who English is a second language, people who are marginalized to be able to take part in this in this visioning. So I want to know more about what is the act, you know, the, the the more detailed plan in regards to, to this. Right. So so the National Day of Racial Healing is was designed to be the kickoff for those conversations. And the work that Dr. Love did was the preliminary work to have facilitators who would guide us through the conversations. And through her training, she has left us a blueprint to follow that envisions a series of conversations with um, different members or community aspects of the community that would guide us through. I think it's a four part process. I'm, you know, I don't have the information right in front of me. So, but I believe it um, envisions like four stages of having conversations uh, with various uh, members of the community and then additional conversations until you end up with a final product, with, which would be the recommendations of community members about um, how they could enter into racial healing and racial reconciliation, how the town could address some of their um, concerns. And um, a Dr. Love um, has stated that she would be willing, it's been, um, as you know, it was quite difficult to have our schedules align initially, 
that would took us quite a while to even schedule the initial um, sessions with her, but she has stated um, in the past that she would be willing to work with Jennifer and myself and with the facilitators that she trained to guide us through the process. So the thinking is that the National Day of Racial Healing will be the kickoff of what we hope will probably be bi-monthly sessions um, that will allow us to work our way through the process. Okay. Um, yeah, I think with, with that, you know, if I could get more of a kind of detailed plan of, you know, in regards to what all of that will entail, who you all are outreaching to, and whether you are getting these other voices, as opposed to the same group of people well, to we, do these things. We went through that visioning process with Dr. Love and, um, and developed a list uh, based on her input and the people who participated as well as Jennifer's input. So I know that the idea is to have a very broad call, but of course, you know, who will we respond to that? I do not know. Okay, I'll continue to um, inquire about these things. on DEI updates and announcements before we move on to public comment. Yes. I don't have anything more unless anyone has any additional questions. I don't see anybody with hands right now, so I'm going to do the public comment thing. Um... During the public comment period, the chair will recognize members of the public. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name, pronoun. <laughs> My goodness. Preferred pronouns and residential address. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes at the discretion of the chair based upon the number of people who wish to speak. No speaker can cede their time to another speaker. The CSSJC will not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised during public comment. Um, I do see eight attendees. Um, if you would like to make a public comment, please raise your hand. We will also have an additional public comment period at the end of our meeting if nothing moves you right now, but something moves you later. Hands up. So I am going to have us move on. Um, do we have any member reports? Um, I think the only one that I want to kind of share is around the um, Judy Brooks series that that myself and Allegra were invited by the uh, Racial Justice Committee uh, with the League of Women Voters uh, to present um it was in January right <laughs> I'm kind of like it's, things just flow one into the other but um yeah in January and uh, we presented working towards racial equity and social justice in Amherst and really giving everyone uh, kind of a briefing on the CSWG recommendations and the status of where they're at as of today um and um also talking about just the CSSJC and our charge and and uh, what we're doing and also talking about CRESS and giving some information around where um, CRESS is at. Um, it was very well received. We got a variety of questions um, and you know, wanna thank the League of Women of Voters for the opportunity um, for us to talk about these uh, pressing issues. Since again, like I said, um, the community is watching, um, they're listening, um, knowledge is power, and we wanna make sure that they have the knowledge so that they're able to continue to, um, you know, participate and have their voices heard. Um, so very thankful for that opportunity. Anything to add to that? Um, the only other thing I realized I forgot to announce, um, and it's kind of a moot point because it's happening right now, 
but there is a um, a meeting of the school equity action committee. So they are trying to get um, conversations of equity back up and running around the schools. Um, and so they'll be kind of recreating their charge and committee composition and structure. So that's happening. Who, who's um, who's host, like who's leading that or? So and I believe that I, th I think Bridget Hines from the Amherst School Committee and William Scher from the Pelham School Committee are going to be the two representatives of the school committee that will be involved with the to attend the meetings. Um, so. So, Allegra, when you kind of go, you back away, sometimes we lose some of what you're saying. Um, but yeah, if you can share more information on the on that, that would be great. Because um, yeah. I'm interested in finding out more about that. Yeah. I mean, I think, right, I think today was their first meeting since the new school committee has been seated. So I think they're really just trying to figure out what they're doing. Um, so hopefully there will be more concrete information after tonight and that will be that should be available i believe on the school um school committee website on the school website arps.org um but you know that is especially as we're interested in youth empowerment we can't forget that our schools play a big part in the lives of our youth so we want to make sure things are going well in the schools and people are being included and Things are equitable. So um, let's see. Should we move on to Cress? You guys are muted. Do you want to start with the hiring sheet? Sure. So we'll clear that one. So um we uh, decided that we would each sort of specialize in specific areas of press. And so Chief Nelson's going to give the update on the hiring process. Yeah, so we've hired, hired three uh, response responders, new, new, new response responders. Uh, it's a unique group. They all, they all bring a little bit of some, something, something to, to different to, to, the, to the table. Uh, we brought brought them in on the 16th of last 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 month. They were still in, you know, a train 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 phase. That's going to be at least seven weeks, right? Seven to seven week 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 weeks of very train train. Um, no, we brought them uh, we brought brought them out to the far 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 in a couple of weeks weeks uh, a couple of weeks weeks we sort of meet the meet the meet the uh, meet, meet that particular particular shift, and it, it was a uh, good, good meet, meeting. Good kind of mixing. Uh, getting, getting to know, 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 know each other and capabilities and expectations. But these uh, three are, are going to be be good. And, and as I said, they they they're mix, mixing well with the the five the five we all we all already have. So I'm um, I'm I'm excited. I think we're all we're all we're all excited 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 about the potential 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 and. You know what I like like to say about our our department, and I think it, I think it, uh, I think it uh, fits fits here too. <laughs> we hire good people first, you know, and, that, and that's and that's and that's and that's huge. You know, these, these are um, the whole the whole group all the way. They're really good people. So, so I have a question. Um, so you said that it's you you hired three. Three responders or two? I wasn't. I couldn't three, hear. Three. Three. Three responders. Yeah. Um. And um. They're. I'm assuming bringing you know wealth of 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 experience. Um. Do you know if they speak other languages? Um. Those sort of things. Uh. Can you no. No, no. Uh, all English English speaking. One is just just finishing up her uh, degree in. Uh, so 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 social work 
I know that another one sort of working on, on a map, 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 masters as well. And third is has a lot of live, 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 experience and is from, from town. So she's familiar, 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 familiar with, 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 with both, both here. It's a good mix. It's a good, good mix, mix, mix of uh, experience and education and tra training that they all, they all bring. So. And again, as I said, it mixes well with the vibe that are that, that, that right here for, for prior to them or right away. Okay, good. Thank you. I appreciate it. Ah. I'm happy to hear that you all were able to hire three more. Um, obviously, that's very good news. I know when the first set of responders was hired, there were like profiles on them in the, like the town website or whatever. Is that something that will happen with these new responders so that people We'll see their face yeah, we, and get we used to. Yeah, we yeah we we tend to tend yeah we we, we can do do that we we do 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 that in my in my in my in my part 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 of well as well. You know, show 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 case 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 as well. So yeah, sure. Another, so I think it helps put a face. Another, another way 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 for folks folks in the, around around town they get we get we get to know 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 who's who who's working for them. other questions about the hiring um this is this is not about the responders so i don't know if it would be you chief or, or pamela that that could talk more about this but uh, again just to kind of put it on on you all scope and then of course it'll it'll be something that i'll be asking of the new director of crest um to make sure that uh an assistant director someone that would be a, a number two to take over if anything were to happen to the director, um, you know, that that is the position after the director is hired, that that's the next position to be, um, you know, filled. So I just wanted to know whether that's on people's lists or whose list it is. Is it, a, is it the town manager or whomever? Because that's something that I'm going to be uh, monitoring very closely because, you know, what transpired um, shouldn't transpire again where there's no number two uh, within um, within Crest. So um, can anyone speak to that? Sure. So the interim leadership team is preparing for the transition um, with the hiring of the new um, director. And part of that preparation is to prepare a, a very comprehensive report about what we've been doing for the last, which will probably soon be six months before the director arrives, as well as a list of recommendations. Um, and included in that list of recommendations is a, recommend is a recommendation that the department organizational structure be changed to include an assistant, but that will be a decision of the town manager. Uh, I, I think that the prior organizational structure um, attempted to have someone uh, in the position that you're referring to, but they used a different title. So the title program assistant was designed to be a combination of an, of an assistant director and an administrative assistant position, which I think uh, really encompassed too many responsibilities under one job title. That job title was also a part of the collective bargaining unit. And I think an assistant director position would be um, outside of the uh, outside of the union. So part of the negotiation would be um, to create a different structure and to negotiate with the union for the loss of a position, right? Because the current position is part of the union, and um, and if the change is made, that change, the new assistant director position will be out of the union. So all of those are things that we have um, thought about and are considering, and will be among the I think vast list of recommendations that we're preparing for the town manager and as a handoff to the new director. Um, so I'm, ha I'm happy to hear that you all including that and in recommendations um, to the town manager. But yeah, and equivocally, you know, the, 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 this crest, the department can't um, continue on in a healthy and powerful and strong way if they do not have 
a clear uh, person who would take over if something were to happen. As we all know, none of us are irreplaceable and things like that. So we always have to have someone that would be able to 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 take um, over. And and obviously that wasn't the case when when everything happened in terms of Crest. So um, this is going to be something that you know. I'm glad you all have the recommendations, but obviously it's going to be something that we're going to be monitoring very closely. So I think that's um, one assistant director too, so you're not tapped for this again. I will not be tasked with this again. <laughs> I, I can assure you. Um, the uh, I think following the hiring, it would probably be a good um, place for Kat to step in and talk about the training, both for the uh, new uh, responders and the existing um, responders. And so perhaps everyone has a question prior to the training piece. I, I do. Thank you. Is, is there a requirement that Chris be the entire Chris staff be in the union? So all of the responders are part of the SEIU uh, union. So they they all have unionized position. Their collective bargaining agreement was um, finalized uh, just this fall, and I think that that the at the creation of the department. Um, uh, you know, I would say to the credit of the town, they decided to make the positions unionized positions. Um, they're in the same union as the dispatchers. So the dispatchers are also in the SEIU um, union. Um, their current contract um, will be up for renewal, I think, in 2026. I think it's about 20... Three, three years. Three years, okay. From, from, from last fall. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah, but I think it, yeah, so I think it will, so maybe 2026 or 2027, the, the collective bargaining um, agreement will be up for renewal. But the but the director position is a town non union. Uh, the director position yeah. is non union, and I think um, what um, and I you know I don't know the history behind it, but if you were to look at what was the program assistant position description, which was a unionized position, it reads um, with some duties of a of administrative assistant and some duties that were. Um, that were really, I would classify as non-union, as, as an assistant director. Um, and there was someone in that position, that individual actually left before the uh, former director left. So um, I, you know, I think that the, the department was left with their responders and with, um, with Kat, who was in the position of the grant implementation manager. So, um, you know, it's, an unfortunate situ situation. I do think that there is a strong argument to make that there should be uh, a new organizational structure for the department. And 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 if I may suggest, just just thinking out loud, given that um, it's a leadership position, um, it may make sense that that is not a union position. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It would be would be non-union. I think the the conversation with the um, with the union is why we're taking a position away from the union, right? And and placing it in a non-union. Um, but if you look at the job, if you look at the current, if you look at the responsibilities, they would obviously be outside of the union, right? It's it's an it, an assistant director position should be a non-union position. I agree, thank you. Um, I, I have a follow-up question, um, which was good, Everald, that you asked some of these questions because it kind of, you know, I started thinking about it, Pamela, when you had talked about the fact that um, there would be a loss of a position. I mean, you know, given what Crest is doing and the urgent and necessary work that Crest is doing, um, I don't know why there would be a need to lose a position. Like you said, that position had also administrative assistant duties. Um, you know, Crest is, is you know, if you look at the CSWG original um, staffing uh, positions that we had recommended, which was, you know, a lot more with an assistant director, with different shift supervisors and things like that. It, I don't believe you need to lose a position. That position could be, you know, 
someone in terms of that, right? In terms of the need, whether it be a, a shift supervisor or, or someone like that with administrative kind of support uh, needs and things, there is need there. You know, there is a, 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 a place to make an argument to keep that position and add the assistant director position. And so I, I don't know why there would be a need to, to lose given the fact okay. that we're trying to stabilize Cress grow Cress and make sure that it's it's um, staffed fully because it still to this point is not staffed fully. Even with an assistant director, it won't be staffed fully. So I just want to make that point that I don't believe that there is a need to um, lose a position. Right. It's so just I, a need I think... to, to recraft it and, and make sure. And since you all are there and you've been doing the job, uh, you know, I would think that you would agree with the fact that there's actually a need to keep that position and add the system director? Well, my recommendation actually is to change the position. Uh, I think that there is, uh, my recommendation for a restructure would be a director, an assistant director, and an administrative assistant. I think these are all decisions that the town manager will have to make, but certainly that would be um, my recommendation. And one of the things as a leadership team, uh, you know, we have tried to, um, to work obviously collaboratively, but we each have individual opinions about various aspects. And we've agreed as a leadership team that we will each submit recommendations. So where there are points of disagreement, all of the recommendations will be presented to the town manager for him to make a decision. My personal opinion is that uh, the structure should include an assistant director, an administrative assistant, and because of the um, DPH grant, I would also argue that there should be a clinical social worker because the grant really envisioned um, that there would be um, by racial uh, teams with a clinical social worker and a, a member of the community with lived experience. But you know, not not everyone has to follow my opinion, but I think that. The, the team will, the leadership team as a whole will all submit um, recommendations and on, on a number of different points and then it will be up to the town manager to make those decisions. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, am I understanding correctly that the recommendation is not collectively from the leadership team, it's individual recommendation? So the, the leadership team is gonna create, um, um, you know, a formal report that will come from us as a team, but we also agree that we're, there are points where we are in, you know, that we don't all see exactly eye to eye, that all of the recommendations would go forward so that, you know, the town manager has all of the good thinking of the team on the issues where we agree or on issues where we might think that there might be a better approach. All of the various thoughts would go forward. So it will it will go forth with all of the of the ideas. It's not we're not trying to necessarily reach consensus on each point and only put that point forward. All of the ideas will be submitted. And the other the other piece of this is that we all have these different skill skill sets. So that 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 we brought brought the bear 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 here. So because because of that. And and you know again we 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 all have have our little our 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 areas air, air, air of expertise. So they based on that the smart smart thing going to do is and if it, it's a better and efficient thing to do is is is, is to bring bring forth those 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 things where, where that that are in in our wheel wheelhouse for for for, for say, so that we can put all all our uh, options out out there. So. While I understand that, um, what do you guys have consensus on? Is there a consensus on an assistant director? Um, what, what do you have um, consensus on as a group? So I think we are still in the process of finalizing the report. Like we've, uh, we've, uh, we sat down as a group and decided what are the topics that we would need to cover in our final report and have divided some of those responsibilities up. So not one person is writing the, this massive document. And, um, and so we envision that we will divide the work and then gather again to review the comments that are made by each of us. And um, so we're still in the process of that. I think I would safely say that we all uh, agree that we should have an, 
an assistant uh, director position, but we haven't gone through the laundry list of everything that we think should be um, in the final report and in the recommendations. We just started to think about that work this week. Okay, that's fair. Thank you. Pamela, um, quickly, just a quick question around the clinical social work. Uh, you know, be interested in in hearing more about your recommendation in regards to that. Um, obviously, again, it would be you know exciting to hear more about it, um, especially if it is in terms of um, social worker that you know has you know lived experience or has experience you know working with the community. Um, in a way that is, you know, you know, um, nurturing and holistic and, you know, as opposed to, you know, sometimes how some um, clinical social workers, the route that they can go if they're very traditional in, in terms of their training. So okay. I think it would have to be kind of like, you know, kind of dissected more in terms of when we're talking about making that type of, of recommendation. So I, I, that recommendation comes from the current grant. Our, our funders actually thought that that was the model that they were funding. And so there is a disconnect between the Department of Public Health grant as it was written and the current structure of the department. Um, so my recommendation is that we lean more to our what the funders um, thought that they were actually pro providing financial support for so that we can retain the financial support. And while it's unlikely that we would be able to, because the grant specifically says um, responders in pairs of two with a clinical social worker and a member of the community. Um, that is not the model that was hired. Um, it is not likely that that would be the model that we could stand up. So I'm trying to think um, proactively, how can we lean into what the grant said that we were going to do? And one way to lean into that is to have a clinical social worker on staff. I also, the, the current grant also addressed um, providing uh, for the provision of services in the community and that grant, that aspect of the grant has been uh, fulfilled by uh, a contract with the Wildflower Alliance. Having someone in-house who might be able to perform some of those functions gives the department a little bit more flexibility about the types of services that it provides in the community. Can I just ask a follow-up? Because I thought I heard Chief Nelson say that two of the new responders, one has a degree in social work and one is working towards a clinical degree. Is that? One has a degree, who's com one is com completing a degree in social work. Okay. So would one of those people at least count as worse partway to that meeting? Exactly. Level? exactly. One, one, of, one of the individuals helps us uh, meet the current requirements of the grant, right? Um, or it leans us at least toward, towards the grant um, requirements. Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously, you know, um, nothing against grants. And of course we need we need funding and things like that, but we just wanna make sure that it's also staying um, true to the vision of, you know, Crest and the needs that the community has, as opposed to trying to uh, meet the grants needs. You see what I'm saying? So I think we wanna, you know, focus on what it is that the community needs and what are some of the issues that Crest is, is handling and, and some of the visioning that, you know, that we had, CSWG had when we were creating CRESS. So do we think we can move on to hearing a little bit more about training and then if more questions pop up, we can have like a final yeah, question. Yeah, about training and also dispatch and numbers yeah. and data and all of those good things. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of training, as Chief Nelson said, folks started on the 16th of January. Um, they're going to be undergoing seven weeks of training. Um, so it'll conclude on March 1st. Um, they're four weeks in. Um, and so far it's been a variety of sort of different um, pieces. I don't know if there's questions. I'll sort of leave it at that for now, but. Are they following some of the same trainings that the original responders got? 
So our main sort of onboarding um, for our original responders included motivational interviewing and then training from the Wildflower Alliance. We are continuing to do that. Um, and then we're also um, replicating many of the same and also adding some additional pieces in. Um, and now that we've done this once before, we're also sort of, you know, changing the order of how we're onboarding them and things like that. And then also by the nature of the department now existing for a year, some of those trainings are different um, because some of those practices have been established that when our original responders went through, those didn't exist at the time. So. What what training is being given to respond to um, low level emergency calls, so to speak? Yeah, so, um, so far we've had all of our folks participate in mental health for first aid uh, responders. We've had um, the Wildflower Alliance um, covers that. Um, and then we've also had um, an autism and law enforcement coalition come in. Uh, we've done a variety of sort of online trainings, um, some of the DPH trainings that um, public health trainings that cover some of that, but they've done things on opioid use and things like that. Um, we're also leaning in heavily on some of our community um, providers and members. And so, for example, we've had the Amherst neighbors come in. Um, they've also uh, gone over and partnered with the Family Bridge Resource Center um, they'll be meeting also with Craig's door. So also looking at some of those folks that are, are navigating that sort of on the ground and working with those folks um, to talk about sort of best practices and approaches around that. That's a couple of them. But. So I, I know that um, <clears throat> safety is always a big concern. So I preface that by asking this question. Is there any part of the training where there's an option to write it up, write right along with an officer just to observe? So it's something that we're exploring. That was something that wasn't done the first time around due to um, collective bargaining agreements. Um, and then we've also reached out with Amherst College to do some of their ride alongs. Their model is very similar to ours in some ways through their um, CSAs that are there, the Community Safety Assistance. Um, and so that's something that we'll also do. Um, and yeah. Thank you. Um, in terms of those uh, trainings that that they're receiving, um, you know, of course, one of the the, the heavy emphasis for, for the crest responders is around um, de escalation and mediation, um, and obviously, yeah, when you're doing de escalation, of course, you know, in terms of communication, um, um, compassion, and obviously with a um, anti-racist uh, focus and anti-racist lens. Um, so are they getting that type of training? Um, and, and, you know. Yeah, um, so I think that, right, so there's de-escalation training uh, that is specific de-escalation training. We do that in a sort of two different ways. Um, and then I think, to, Deborah, I think I appreciate you talking about the way around um, you know, communication and compassion and pieces um, are always a part of de-escalation, right? And so that's really infused throughout our training. Um, so a couple of things, um, for example, um, their motivational interviewing touches on that. The Wildflower Alliance touches on that. Um, we had all of our um, new folks participate um, in the National Day of Racial Healing that we did as a staff um, hosted events. Our original responders are all trained as facilitators in that. We also have started um, their first week off with restorative justice circles, um, particularly around work ethics, um, professionalism, um, trust, integrity, some of these other pieces and how that um, kind of translates. Uh, we've also had conversations around um, the mission and initial call types. And so that also brings in some of those pieces specifically around the anti-racist lens. Um, even, you know, I would say even in some of our report writing and trainings and things like that, how we refer and how we write our reports and things like that. Um, they've also done, uh, we've had folks visit the Amherst Survival Center and talk about pieces around that. Uh, it's We've done a second autism, I mean, a second RJ circle. This was part of the autism training. Um, we also had them uh, read and review both the LEAP report and the DPH grant. And so that's heavily, um, that lens is heavily obviously in that language and all of that um, kind of um, th that information. Uh, we've also done some new training specifically through the Massachusetts Office of Victim Assistance uh, with human traffic awareness. Um, we've had them connect so far with veteran folks. Um, so all of this, I think, is to say that 
all of those de-escalation um, really translates and looks different depending on who you're working with, right? So the conversation with our veterans outreach person is going to look really different than potentially with our, our motivational interviewing um, person and things like that. Um, so those are a couple of them. Okay, that's um, and then also, sorry, the other thing I want to ask with that specifically is we're also having them do microaggressions, racial equity uh, 101, and race and racism 101 trainings as well. So that's always covered. Um, and those will be repeat for some of our other folks, um, but those, they all participate in that. Okay, that's good. Um, because again, you know, and I think I've already touched upon it, and I think last meeting uh, in December that we had, um, there's always the question of of safety, um, you know, for the responders, and obviously since one of their, um, you know, I'm assuming es essential functions is um, de-escalation, um, you know, that would be an important part of them to receive that training, you know, with that anti-racist um, lens um, and you know inclusive lens put into it. Um, so doing that well, obviously will help in terms of them being able to stay safe when they go out to responding to a variety of different um, calls. And especially as we were wanting, you know, them to be dispatched to, to more calls. Um, and, you know, and again, being able to service, like you said, right, there's a variety of different populations, you know, veterans, um, you know, population based on race, uh, different uh, different abilities, sexual orientations, uh, genders, and, you know, all of that. So we want to make sure that, um, you know, um, the responders are getting the, that, that type of specific training. I know beforehand, you know, with the previous director, that was one of the, the focuses that he had. This may not necessarily be a training question, but what collaboration, if any, have you guys had with the Northwestern District Attorney's Office? So we've uh, we've had some collaboration with them uh, back in September, so prior to our new folks coming on, um, and we also see them at some of our um, uh, some of the other meetings that we're in. Um, but we may reach out to them. There's a series of different trainings that we may reach out to about them as well. So. I think that would make sense. Um, and because I, I think um, if anyone knows Dave Sullivan and yeah. quite frankly, the, the office, yeah. um, this would be something that they would support, um, Cress. Mm -hmm. So I think it does make sense to actually, um, if not have someone come in and speak with um, the people that are in training, talk about best practices, um, things that the DA's office do with low level crimes because again, um, spending as much time in court, they would support anything that keeps people um, from being arrested out of court if if they can. They, they're that supportive of those kinds of um, diversion programs. Yeah, we've really enjoyed our overlap with Dave Sullivan and every time our responders have met with him, they, but we're, we would echo that exact same sentiment. So I appreciate your comment. Okay. So um, unless anybody has another question about training, we'll move on to dispatch and operations. Okay. So um, as we were, uh, as previously stated, dispatch or crest responders went live on dispatch back in December 18th. And they started with um, six call types, which I think was uh, above kind of what the national standard was in terms of how many you start at initiation. But I think in terms of time frame for when we went live was probably right on par. Since then we have added an additional call type of um, press presence walks. So, uh, Slowly but surely, as we start getting used to operations and protocols and things like that, we are the hope is to continue to add um, calls and, and specifically identifying what types of calls responders are going to go to and again, how to kind of label that call type to capture the work that they're doing. So um, since they went live in December, as of today, they have 70 um, computer aided dispatches entered into the system. Um, off the top of my head, I don't have the breakdown in terms of what specific calls that they were, but 70 is, is a pretty hefty number um, in the last 
month and a half or so. Um, can you remind us again what are the other uh, um, calls that they're that they're getting? And also, can you talk a little bit more about presence walks? What does that mean? And then I have a couple more questions. Sure. So uh, they started with Cress Admin, um, Cress Assist Citizen, Cress Assist Business, uh, Wellbeing Checks, uh, Cress Mental Health, Cress Follow Up, and the most recent one is the Cress Presence Walk. And so what that presence walk is, is just the responders getting out into the community, but being able to document those engagements and interactions. So they get a call to do the presence walk? So they it's, get dispatched to do that? I no, guess. So, so, being, so being on dispatch isn't simply being dispatched, so to speak. So it's not always that someone from the dispatch center is going to send them out somewhere. Responders, depending on uh, what they have going on on their day, can self-initiate. But when they do self-initiate, we still want that work captured. So they would call into dispatch to identify where they are so that if dispatch does get a call, they'll know where they are and they'll know who they have available to send on whatever call they have. So that's how the, the walk is incorporated. Okay, so it's basically something that they were already doing, but now it's just capturing that through dispatch. Correct. Okay. So... Um... So then really the 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 ones that they're that's new but kind of like that was initiated back in in, in December 18th is the admin assist citizen assist business well-being and follow up So so those were all the ones that were already in place in December yeah. the newest one that was added was presence walk yes Yeah no that's what I'm saying so oh, okay. so, so yeah mm -hmm. um yeah so presence walks is it's new, but not new, <laughs> I guess is what I'm right. saying. Well, it's, I think it's being captured by dispatch. So yes, great, wonderful. But um, it's not necessarily new in terms of what I would envision as new calls, like that they're getting new calls. Like I said, mm -hmm. I mean, last time when I was at, you know, at, at our last meeting and, you know, the chief and I got into a nice, healthy discussion um, was around the fact that I felt like other calls should they should be getting dispatched to just like noise complaints and any other calls that that don't include violence that could even be disorderly uh, and and those types of calls and so that's what I'm more interested in finding out why aren't those calls um, being you know why aren't they being dispatched to those calls and I I know I've been given the 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 um, you know, explanation of safety and so on and so forth. And that's why I'm just kind of like they've received, you know, the five that were there received a lot of training around the de escalation, keeping themselves safe. And so that's why I wanted to ask more questions around what the training is for the three new responders, because again, doing that. And so I, I, I don't, I don't see where there's this um, emphasis in terms of this protective, almost paternalistic um, um, sense of protection um, when you know the 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 focus of of Cress is to do all things um, non-violent that you know that they should you know that they can do. So um, so yeah, I, I want to hear more about when are when are the other calls going to be rolled out. So I, I don't have an answer for when the other calls are going to roll out. I think that is dependent on responder training and um, other things that we're currently evaluating in terms of standardizing some sort of policies and procedures. Um, and I also think that there needs to be a look at what additional calls we can add. And again, keeping the responder safety in mind, because although you mentioned uh, nonviolent calls like a noise complaint as an officer in this town for 25 years, I can tell you that noise complaints do have the potential to escalate very quickly. Um, and so then it's identifying, you know, is this one of those potentials or is it not one of those potentials? So again, I think we need to start small and continue to work to that. I'm not saying it can't happen, but I think that that's just not where we are in the department yet. Yeah, but that's where I disagree. And I think that a lot of reasons where the noise complaints have escalated is because the police have gone to those noise complaints. And I, I spoke about this at the last meeting, because I was one of the ones that had been at a noise complaint where it was just adults, black professionals who are at this event at someone's home. And 
and the police wanted to just escalate with us <laughs> when we were just trying to de-escalate. So that's why I feel very um, um, strongly about the fact that I think a lot of times it's the police that escalate. And so that's why it would be important for the um, crest responders to be there. When we envision uh, crest responders, and it is in the LEAP report, and I and I went and looked at the LEAP report, you know, and looked at some of the other um, you know, programs that we study like Cahoots and the one in Denver and everything that basically, and they big cities, they have a gazillion issues and things like that. And, and they didn't have those, those types of, um, when their responders went out, they weren't accosted, they weren't assaulted. They weren't, you know, if you looked at those statistics that we relied on back then, I, I mean, I haven't looked at the more recent ones, but the those that we relied on on before in, in our leap report that the that that, that leap um, um, created for us, and then it was only in like 0.2 percent out of all of the calls that they went out that they actually contacted the police for the police to come in to to assist them. And these are big cities, and so we're talking about Amherst. So I'm just like you know, I, you know, I, this was two months ago. I had had this conversation with the chief. And we're two months later and there's still no plan in terms of adding other calls. The one that you added, like I said, is something that they're already doing. So great that now it's gonna be documented through this dispatch, wonderful. However, when are some of these other calls going to be added? Again, I don't have an answer for you. I think that that's a continued conversation that we're having, not saying that it can't happen. I'm just saying that's not where we're at as a department yet. And, and when are you all going to be at? We as 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 I said the last the last last time we're going to crawl. Well, two months ago, two months ago. Two months is too much. And one one of the things I I said this is going to take as long as it takes. We're going to get get it right. But we're going to crawl, walk, run. We're going to learn, 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 learn from all the all all the these calls. We debrief, we debrief, debrief the calls, and we learn. Again, it's going to take as long as as long as long as long as it takes. Uh, and, and one of the, one of the, and one of the big things is response 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 responder says 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 yes. So sorry, 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 said she's been been here for 20, 25, five, five years. I've been in this 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 business for 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 a while while also we both had to make decisions where we're sending send, sending folks into harm 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 harm's way. That's not any easy decision to to to, to make, and we're not going to take and um and and an order an order at risk with these responders responders save 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 safety. I take it an issue with the with the with the being being described as the term 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 the term and the list. One of our our biggest job is to protect our our people, take care of our people, and that's what we do every every every, every day. And that's what we're doing with the, with the responders, and that's what we're doing in, in as 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 we build build this. We are going to get to the point where we're going to do do more 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 calls. We got to get more. I guess I guess you would say miles under the under our tires here to get it to, to make sure we get 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 it right, right? And that and that really is the bottom 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 line. Sergeant Sergeant Griffin 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 said. It's not that we're not going to get 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 there. We just can't tell 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 you right here and now when that will be. It's not it you know it's not it's not it's not it's not going to be tomorrow. It's not going to be ne ne next 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 week. I doubt that that is kind of and 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 that's not to say that it won't won't be five 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 years years from now. But it's going to be a, it's a work in pro 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 progress here. Problem bottom line. Yeah, I get that, Chief Nelson. I mean, you can take issue with whatever I say, but I'll also take issue with what you all are saying because I'm speaking for the community here, right? I hear from the community that they want these things yesterday, right? Because they're the ones that are suffering on the other end of this, this conversation. Me being part of it too, because I just told you that the experience that I had, you know what I'm saying? So I'm including the community in terms of the experiences that I've had with the police here in, in Amherst. So I'm included in that. Right. So I'm just kind of like, I get it. I get it. You all want to crawl. Right. But as the community, we do not want you all to crawl. You know what I'm saying? We want we want this. We wanted this up and running from before. 
It's been over a year in regards to this situation. And so it's been a battle. Every point has been a battle with just, uh, you know, getting to this point of this patch. And now it's more a battle to, to get it to the point of, uh, of, of getting the calls that could be dispatched to Crest. And then there's this part that you all continue to say without backing it up with data in terms of this, this safety concern where, I, you know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, you're not bringing me facts for me to, for me to actually work with here in terms of why you have this, this safety concern without bringing me facts. And so that's where then I get concerned and I ask questions, right? And so, you know, you can take issue with whatever I say, but I'm still gonna say it. And so I'm gonna continue to, to, to make my point. Harold, I see you had your hand up for a little while. I, I, I do, thank you. So I, I understand both arguments. I, I understand crawl, walk, run, but I also understand um, Deb's frustration with um, the length of time that this has taken. And, and so my, um, my, my comments before my question is, I, I, I get that, um, you're training an entire new department and that will take some time. So yes, we agree. We give you that. That's going to take some time. Um, but the calls that we're talking about where we consider low level and yes, from where you're sitting, it may not, it may be low level to start with, but to your point, can escalate into something. So understanding that not everyone is going to be able to go out and take those calls right away. Um, is there anything that you guys are doing to say, okay, we have Crest as a large department and not everyone is ready to take those calls, but maybe in to Chief Nelson's point, call walk run. Here's a small subset that we can start with crawling and then get into a place of walking. Is, is that part of the training to say, we're not going to train everyone to go out to start with, but maybe one or two people can start with these, what we called low level calls. Well, we, we wouldn't, if I'm understanding your, your question correctly, um, identifying certain responders who can do the call, but not others. Is that what you're, Okay. To start with, to start with, yes. Right. So the the reason why we wouldn't do that is because we want to field them in pairs of two, right, for their safety and as written in the grants. And if we identify particular individuals who are trained uh, more so than other individuals, then what happens is then we run into if somebody takes a day off, or if somebody is in a training, um, or if they're just not here that day, and we get that call, and now we can't go because the people who are trained in that particular subject or area is, is not here. So ideally, we will want everybody trained together so that we're, we have that ability to switch up the teams and send whoever is available versus uh, just certain people. And we want to create equity, too, amongst who's getting sent to what, right? If there's certain responders that have certain training, we know the ones who always get sent to something when certain responders aren't getting sent to anything. We want to try to keep that that there too. I, I understand that. Um, I, I'll table that for now. My, my initial question though, you mentioned um, since um, they've been taking dispatch calls, there've been about 70. Um, can you tell us if from those 70, any of those had the police been dispatched would have led to anyone being arrested? Was there any deterrence, Crest responding, was there any deterrence in arrests? Um, I I wouldn't know that without reading through each individual, uh, one of those calls and, and the narrative and what the call type was. So I, I, I can't answer that with certainty. Okay, understood. Lucette? So I um I oh can I just um, did you have, did you have a answer to the question, Pamela? Well, I have a bit of information that I think goes not goes to Everell's specific question about um, whether someone has whether it has to um, whether there's been a diversion from arrest, but to uh, Deborah's uh, question about 
a plan for stepping up uh, the um, other types of dispatch calls. So um, I, I, I think that we've shared a couple of times that the town has received a non-fiscal grant from the Harvard Kennedy School, their governance performance lab, and the GPL, the Harvard GPL is planning on embedding a fellow um, um, in the department person's not going to physically be here, but will do the work um, that's called upon from, from the department. And we have delayed the start of that fellow um, so that it would coincide as closely as possible with the start of the new director because we want the new director to have the benefit of that um, fellow and the expertise that's coming nationally. So uh, we've been in some preliminary conversations with the GPL about the start of the fellow and have identified as the primary um, work for this fellow, um, a work around increasing the number of uh, types of calls for dispatch and drafting protocol and those things. So there, there are steps in place to further us down the line. Um, the, um, and we've also asked the, because the Harvard the grant is scheduled to end on June 30th, and we have asked if there's a possibility for a year's extension so that the new director would have the benefit of that. So I think that, you know, while we can't speak specifically to this is the timeline that these things will occur, we are definitely trying to put in place the supports that would get the new director and this department um, in a position to continue to add and grow the call types with the support of the um, Harvard GPL fellow. Thank you for that update, Pamela. Lisette. Hi, thank you. Um, so Miss Young actually just answered a little bit of where I was leaning into, um, but I had a question, but I'm gonna ask it still, even though um, I believe, um, sorry, I'm I'm so sorry. Don't recall your name, the female with the black hoodie from dispatch. Um, but pretty much my question was out of all the call types that were listed on the December 19th um, list, how many of those calls actually received the highest volume, which I believe you said you don't have an answer for that. So is you do you not have an answer because you just don't have that information on your person or is there no specific established way of how data is being collected from all these incoming calls? I don't have an answer. I'm, I'm guessing you were talking to me. Correct, yes. All right. Because we both have black on, I just want to make sure I was talking about it back. Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, thank so, you. I, so, yes, of the 70 calls, there is a way to be able to identify specifically what call type each of those were. I just don't have it in front of me right now. Okay. Um, is that something that you can provide for the next meeting? Sure. Okay. Um, I just think that it would be... Um, very helpful, especially since, you know, one of the um, things on, and I'm looking at the 1219 um, list with the Crest Mental Health. I think if we had, if more calls went to the mental health section, um, I think it could shed some light on what Ms. Young had mentioned in regards to a clinical social worker. Um, my following question is out of those 70 calls, were they, Sorry, I have it written here. How many of them were actually properly dispatched? So did any of them require any police presence? So that that sounds like like two questions there, right? Um, properly dispatched means to me that the dispatch center called to the Crest Department and said, we have this call for you at this address. Um, that's different than the dispatch center reaching out to the police direct and telling them, we have this call for you at this address. Okay, so you can answer both. So in terms of calls into the Crest Department of that 70, again, without looking at each of those individual calls, I don't know 
which was from dispatch and which was self-initiated by a responder. Okay. Um, okay. That's it for now. I've rolled and then I'll jump in. I, I just had, um, I, I think Lizette asked my question for Sergeant Lopez. I was going to ask if we can get um, those dispatch logs for those calls um, rather than have you go through all of them. If you can just share them with us, I'm, I'm happy to just look through them for our next meeting as well, bef before our next meeting. Yeah. So you can do a, a public records request and we can um, identify specifically what it is that you're looking for and then have okay. them available for you. We've already as a department received a couple of those. Okay. Um, so I guess just to follow up and again, there might not be an answer to this question, but do you have any idea if of the 70 calls that have been directed from dispatch to Cress, whether they cover a, a range of the things that are on the yes list so far? Like, do you know there've been at least one of each call type or they've... Uh, again, I, I don't want to say yes and be inaccurate, so I, I would have to look again at each of the 70 calls. Mm -hmm. um, when I looked last, yes, there was a range. Um, I, I'm trying to think of... I, I think so, but I, I please don't quote me on that because I'm not certain without looking at, the, at all of them. And then have there still been additional calls coming in just through the regular CRESS number? Yes, yes, there's still people that will call the Crest Department direct and um, in the Banks Community Center, people are still welcome to to walk up to the window and, and ask for whatever assistance it is that they need. And then, um, so in if something is happening outside of Crest's current operational hours, but it's something that Crest could potentially respond to, would there ever be cross departmental communication from the police to say, hey, we did this wellness check last night. We really think it's something that you could handle. Like maybe you could do a follow up with them. Is that something that's a possibility? Yes, and it's already happened where um, the various shift supervisors over at the PD have dealt with uh, a particular call and identified that 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 Crest might be able to do some additional follow up. Yeah. Um, as well as as dispatch taking calls outside of press hours and, and following up again saying hey this is something that we took and um you might be able to better support this person yes and the fire as well yeah. and as, as well as the fire department as well yes we're a little more more uh restricted restricted to the hip of the hip of the hip of regs we, we can't we can, right now we can't refer we couldn't refer for 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 some some someone that that were retreat tree 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 and and we're trying to and because there's no there's no uh, well if if it's if it's uh, if it identifies identifies who that person is to some some someone who's not uh, who's not who's not tree 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 them or not in the in the chain of uh, tree tree and then medically we can't just say. Here, you, you can't. You, we, we can't. We can't say, oh, you know, we, we'll call off credit for credit and then, then it, there's all all kinds of there's all kinds kind kinds of restrictions about about that. We're trying to figure to figure out a way to do to do 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 that that now. But that that's that that again, there's a little bit of a lot of state regulation that keep keeps us from doing that, and it's to protect people people from 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 from. Um. With the new responders onboarding, is there a target date for re-expansion of hours? So I don't think that we have decided that we would um, expand the hours at this point. I um, My thinking around that and the leadership team um, hasn't come to, I would say, a definitive answer. Uh, but I anticipate that there will be a new director in place um, late to mid-March. And um, the 
new responders will be finishing up their training um, on March 1st or 2nd. Um, I think having them um, work with the current group of responders for some additional time um, until that new director is on is probably a good thing. Um, and then the new director can make a decision about expansion of hours, knowing that um, the new responders have been fully trained and have had some, some uh, opportunities to work for some period of time. So I think that that will be a decision for, um, for the new director, but the timing should uh, align with the new director and the um, being appointed and the conclusion of the training of the new hirees. That was very convoluted, but I yeah, but you I think you understand what I'm trying to say. Like, yeah, <laughs> the new director will reassess once yeah. everyone is up to speed. Yeah. Um. I guess, and this is maybe just an idea to throw out there that could be talked about with the new director, but I think it would be really helpful to get a more clear understanding of like when a CIT trained officer might respond to something versus a, the C, the co-responder from CSO versus now Cress coming in, especially with some clinical staff on. Um, so maybe that's like for down the road, a conversation that could incorporate all of those people to talk about kind of the different approaches that each. Right, and one of the things that we have been doing is to have um, our, I guess three responders have gone through CIT training at this point. So we're trying to provide them with that intense uh, professional development. And I think where the um, uh, Harvard GPL fellow will be really helpful is in helping to guide some of those conversations and provide us and um, provide us with a support around that. Like one of the things that Harvard has been very clear about is that they're not placing a fellow in the department to study us, right? But the person is really here to um, to produce deliverables. So if we say, you know, we want your help in creating a triage. Uh, um, protocol for dispatch that would answer your question of like, when does it go to CRESS? When does it go to CSO? When does it go to a CIT? That's the product that we will get. So we're, we're thinking about those, about those questions and trying to plan for the development. I mean, and I will take full responsibility for saying that I felt very strongly that, um, that that work should be done with the new director and not with the interim leadership team so that the new director will get the benefit of, um, of that work and of that expertise rather having it shared uh, among us and the person not um, you know getting it secondhand and or getting our getting our opinion on things. I think having the new director have the ability to work with the Harvard Fellow very closely will be the best thing for the director and for the department long term. I think that's all my questions. Does anybody so, um, else? Yeah, so for me, just to kind of wrap this up, it's just to, again, um, say that, you know, I want to see a some type of plan in terms of how these dispatch calls are going to be added um, by when. Um, whether it'll be with this with this team or with the director, um, even though you know I, I'm I'm still concerned and cautious in terms of the uh, new director coming in and having the power to do some of these things, um, because as you all know, in terms of CSWG uh, recommendations, it was for you know Crest to take on and to assist, like in some of the other programs, Crest were, were, were doing, you know, 15, 20% of calls or, or, or what have you, which then at the end of the day ends up being that there doesn't have to be more hiring of, of police, right? As opposed to, you know, continuing to have Crest respond to those, to, to, to those calls. So part of why I am talking about that and the community is talking about that because I've people coming to, to talk to me about these things is because that's what they want to see in the long term, right? Is Crest doing more of those calls, 
that can can be focused on de-escalation as opposed to having the police do those calls. So again, I want to see is what's the timeline, how are these things going to take place from you all and or the new director when that, that new director comes in. So my 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 um, questions are going to be continual. So am I to understand that you've completed your questions for the leadership team on this topic? I believe so. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, jinx jinx shocking <laughs> right so i'm um so i'm wondering uh so we obviously tried to all be here together together <laughs> so that we could be but yeah don't plug them in yet mm -hmm. um um to respond i'm wondering whether it would be possible elaborate for me to make you co-host and turn over the meeting to you or do you need a me to re to stay for the re remainder of the meeting. Uh, I think uh, you can make me host. Okay. And I mean, this is recorded. So yeah. kind of, there's other things because I, you know, you might want to hear about our feedback about the forums and things like that, but it's recorded so you can listen to it. Right. Well, I, you, I, I think, um, I've, I, I don't know if I've shared with this group before, um, that I'm unable to drive at night because of issues with my vision. And so um, I would need to get, a, uh, my ride is sitting at the stable home. And if yeah. you guys, I assume that we would take more time, but if we're finishing early, rather than um, then have someone wait for me, yeah. I, if that would be okay, that would kind yeah. of- that. Yeah, it makes sense. Oh, absolutely. Well, we appreciate all your time tonight and hopefully next week, next month, we won't have to meet with you because there will be a new director, um, but they probably will be on like day one. So yeah. we hope uh, that maybe last, you know, this is our last or second to last meeting with you all and that we'd love to also get a copy of your recommendations to the town manager just so that we have an understanding of you know, what your time has encompassed more so than what you've been able to tell us in these meetings and to understand kind of the vision for moving forward. Maybe maybe what could be helpful too to the town managers for us to provide CSSGC to provide some recommendations um, that could be helpful to the director. That could be a good idea, I think. But I want to thank you all though for, for showing up today and being willing to um, um, share information and interact with us and respond to our questions. Appreciate it. Yes, thank you. So, Oliver, I've made you host. All right. And there, you you did have a participant raise their hand. Um, so I I don't know how if the hand is still raised, but okay. Um. Usually we wait for people for to comment time. till the end of yeah. the meeting. Um, so I will come back around at the end of the meeting for the public comment. Um, Does it make sense to just do a public comment since the group is leaving? Maybe the group wants to say something for their benefit. Mm -hmm. for their Okay, yeah, that that it seems like the person wants to do that. I think that might be a good idea. All right, we will do one quick one, <laughs> quick one, and then we will have our full public comment at the end. All right, <laughs> all right. Thank you. It's it's Martha Hanner. I live in uh, Alyssum Drive in South Amherst, and thank you very much. I, I did have a couple of questions. Thank you very much to the Crest team for for coming and all your explanations. I also attended the Cup of Joe in January and learned a little more about press. And so my my first main question is that the budget for the next fiscal year is being worked on right now in January, it, although it doesn't take effect until June. And so the question is, you know, how many press positions are in the budget? And if your report is not going to be completed for a few months, Will your report have any impact then on the decisions about the budget 
or will it be too late to uh, impact anything that the town manager or town council decides? So um, the uh, budgeting process for the town has just gotten underway, like uh, I believe maybe the beginning of, um, of January. And so it was a little delayed. And the initial round for the process was for the um, finance um, um, department to send us the report from last year and to look at what the requests were from last year's budget and for us to update the budget narrative. That's the first part. And um, the way that it worked um, last year, which as you know, Martha, was my first year going through it. It was a three part process with first a budget narrative, then a one-on-one -on -one with um, the finance director um, to discuss each the department's budget and then a final submission or request. So we've completed the first part, which was to submit um, the uh, budget, well, to submit the narrative. And in that narrative, we did include some information for what we thought would be the proposed structure. So um, talking about the creation of an assistant director um, position, because we are anticipating um, hopefully that that position will be part of the new budget. So we've completed the first stage. We haven't yet gotten to the second stage of reviewing the finances to um, to submit or to have that one-on-one -on -one conversation. We haven't. I haven't received an an appointment uh, with the finance department to have that conversation. So I'm doing that process on behalf of Cress and anticipate that when the new uh, director is hired, I will walk hand in hand with that person through the process so that you know they're not going into the process blind, but we'll have some suggestions. So we are we are aware that you know this transition is going to occur mid process. And I think you had a second question, but I'm not sure if I answered it. Yeah, so that the that you answered partly that the position of assistant director mm -hmm. hopefully will make it into that the budget for the next year so we wouldn't have to wait a whole right yes exactly. year for that yeah. yes and the other question was about uh the hours when i was at the cup of joe it was stated that violent incidents tended to occur after 10 p.m and so then I wonder whether it's possible uh, fairly soon in the process to extend Cress's hours into that second shift from 4 to 10 p.m. so that then Cress would be covering at least the evening hours still while concerns about safety you know, later have to be worked out. Right. So as you heard me say earlier, I, I think that the extension in, so the, the way in which the shifts ran before was from 8 to 8. So it was from 8 a.m. until 8 a.m. Um, to 8 p.m. So it would require an adjustment to, you know, have someone perhaps do 10 to um, come in. I can't do the math right now, but anyway, to extend to, to 10 to 10 p.m. Um, and I think that the, um, the structure of the extended hours should be a decision for the new director. Um, I also think that having um, our current new hires on for a little bit of time, so they've just gone through the training, they'll have a, really a month under their belt. When the new director comes in, having that person be able to make the decision about what the shift looks like um, I think is, in my opinion, sort of the best way to move forward. It is certainly has been the intention that we'll go back to extended hours. One of the other concerns about extended hours is that um, the extended hours were here in the Bang Center, and the Bang Center has uh, typically closes at 4 p.m., and so we have to think not only about extending hours, but where should those responders uh, be located physically so that they're accessible to the public and to people who need them and so that it's not so there's there's a couple of questions there that we've been um, thinking about as a leadership team and I think we'll try to have some recommendations in place for the new director but I think it will be the new director who will ma ultimately make that decision 
Okay, thank you. Um, so now Ms. Pat also has her hand up. I'm just gonna ask if she has a question for the leadership team. Actually, no, is this a public comment time? We will have an additional public oh. comment at the very end. Oh, I'm end. sorry. Okay. Oh, no, that's okay. Unless, oh. unless, Ms. Pat, unless you had something to say for, for the um the temporary leader, uh, Christ leadership team. If you do, you can make it. Yeah, if, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, first of all, I want to thank the leadership team for taking on extra role. But very quickly, what I've heard tonight to me, it's not only frustrating, depressing, and discouraging, but this is all about racist practice and policies by our town government. And what I meant by that is a town council who refuse to fully fund CRES. And you guys meet month after month discussing CRES. I just want to issue a warning that CRES will fail again if it's not fully funded. There has to be three shift supervisors in order for this to work. I wanna thank uh, Ms. Pamela for adding assistant director, but just to be clear, when CSWG, rec uh, when we made our recommendation, the program assistant to do administrative duties and the shift supervisors are supposed to be administrators. So in situation where Mr. Earl left, one of the shift supervisors would have been appointed to be temporary director. But it did not happen because the town council refused to fully fund Crest because the police machine is pushing back on, on having the existence of Crest. This is all about racism in our town and it's not it's nothing like you know against the leadership temporary leadership team it's about the town council that make decision it's about the the uh finance committee that refused to fully fund crest we're still talking about resident resident oversight after several years although seven gen and leap already made all this why I, why, why are we wasting time in uh, time in this town? Racial healing, uh, uh, anti uh, uh, bias lens, this and that. This is all just talk. Crest will benefit marginalized group in our town, and our town town council doesn't feel that they need to do the right thing. That's all I want to say. For now. Thank you, Ms. Pat. And we'll have another um, public comment at the end. So Everell has had his hand raised. I don't know if he has a question, final question for us. I, I, I don't want to ask during public comment. Okay. Is there, oh, I think uh, Councilwoman Alicia Walker and Arani have their hands up. Uh, this is Ronnie Parker. I just got unmuted, but you called on Alicia. So should I go or wait for her? No, go ahead, Ronnie. Go ahead. Then we'll bring in Alicia. Okay, thank you. I really found um, the report of the Leadership Council and your questions to be extremely interesting, informative. Thank you. Um, I would like to reiterate something that was already said that I've heard a lot in this town, which is that I know that a snail's pace is what's uh, planned with care because, and I understand all the reasons why, but I honestly believe that it has really been too small, a slow a pace. And um, I'm troubled by the discussion that you need to have, you must have um, 24 hours um, coverage. I feel like it's pretty clear when the priorities are and they're in the evening and at night. So I would say we don't need, a, I'm not sure why we would need a crest team to be available during the nine to five shift. I'm not sure how the shifts are switched. 
I'm just wondering if there's been any consideration to just moving uh, Cress's work um, to different time periods when there is more of a need without feeling like we have to have this nine to five thing, because I don't know what really happens then. Now, obviously things happen because the Cress team has been responding. And I also was very, um, I'll be quick. I also was very taken with the 0.2% of Denver's experience in terms of where is the escalation coming from? And I wonder if we couldn't, if there's some place where we couldn't do more, we couldn't pull up that research again and look at what's happening in Massachusetts um, and other New England or closer to us towns to see um, how they studied that and if we couldn't look into that ourselves. I know we're not able to access the police logs. I feel like they should be open actually to the public myself, but um, there must be some way if this group cannot have access to it for CRESS itself to study that because I think it would be important for you to know where does the risk, where where is the risk and where's the danger for yourself? So that's my comment, thank you. Thank you, Ronnie. Oh, hello. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Alicia Walker. I wanted to just take a moment to thank you all for um, continuing with this incredibly important, but also complicated and challenging work. Um, I just had a couple of things I wanted. <clears throat> I wanted to say just to hope that the team will keep these things in mind as they're finishing up their report. Um, and one of the things is just keeping in mind the original goal and purpose of the Crest Department and why it was created. And so again, just remembering the emphasis on assuring that BIPOC residents are feeling safe in this town and are not falling through the cracks. And this department was really created with the intention of serving residents who may not feel comfortable calling the PD, but may still need a response. Um, and so I just really feel like sometimes that gets lost in the conversation and I want to, you know, sort of shift the focus and emphasis to that. Um, some of the things that were discussed tonight that I hope that you all will look more into. Um, one, I think Ronnie just elaborated really well on the timing. I think it's very clear that a lot of um, crisis situations occur during hours where Crest is not open. And I think thinking about that is going to be critically important to the success and the actual uh, effects that Crest can have on the community. And the other thing is that this notion of Crest responders being unsafe or having some type of liability when responding. And I understand those concerns, but I think we need to move past the concerns and start thinking about what solutions can we put in place so that we do feel comfortable sending uh, these responders to these calls that we actually need them to be responding to instead of just continuing to say that it's not safe at this time. So like, what would make us feel safe? Like, do they just need additional training? And if we're thinking about the trainings right now, what trainings can be added to the onboarding schedule so that we feel safe adding uh, sending the crest responders to these calls? Um, because I think for me, I'm just a little bit lacking understanding of what is the huge difference between having a new person assigned to the PD who has training and then responds response to calls. Um, and so why can't we just make the training or provide whatever information or tools we think the responders need and then send them to the calls? Um, I don't think we need to continue delay, delay, delay. We're not safe. I think to this point, we could have had those trainings in place. And so I, I hope that you all will be looking at how can we reach these goals rather than why we don't feel safe trying to do these things at this time. Um, I think it would be incredibly important and, and strong for you to make those recommendations. Um, so those were just a couple of things that I had in mind. Again, I want to thank you all so much for your time continuing to work on this, and I may have additional public comments later. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Alicia Walker. Thank you, everybody. And again, thank you, leadership team, for listening to the public. Um, so I think I still have a question. Avril, do you have a question? Oh, I, I, I do, but I'm, I'm trying to follow the rules where I don't think we're allowed to do it, uh, to respond to public comments. Oh, no, no, I know, but I'm, oh, I, we haven't officially closed the public comments. Okay, let's officially. Okay, we are back to the committee. I don't know how to send everybody back into the audience, though. Um, yeah. It says remove permission to talk. So I hope that just, okay. 
hopefully that means you're still in the audience. So you should have Allegra um, the option to um, to move them from panelists to attendee. Okay. A, a, in the participants list adjacent to their name, there should be three buttons and there will be uh, We can't do it because I'm, we made you host, but as host. as host, you should have that ability. I think I moved everyone back into attendees. Mm -hmm. Okay, you did. Okay. All right. And I hope that you didn't think I was trying to silence you by using the button that said remove permission. I don't like that wording, but <laughs> um, all right, Everald. No, so um, my, my question was, and, and this came up with one of her comments, um, understanding what the hours are now. And I think Ms. Young said that the director, when he or she's on board, will decide the hours. With, with the current staff, were they hired with a specific set of hours or is there um, extension in consideration? Because that could be problematic. No, so the um, the current staff were all hired knowing that they might have the possibility of working nights and weekends, and that's included in the collective bargaining agreement. So okay. we, I mean, there are a limited staff here on Saturdays and, um, you know, per the collective bargaining agreement. So part of the mechanism is there for this to happen. I just think that it's a decision, you know, the director should have an opportunity to decide how they're going to fill those roles and who's going to, um, you know, going to make those decisions. I, I think, you know, do I have ideas about what I would do if I were in that position? But um, I do think that, it, that it's best for the department long term, if that's a director's call and thinking about how to structure that going forward. I agree with you. That makes perfect sense. Um, they're the person who will be leading the department. So I think they should get the prerogative. All right. Well, thank you all very much. And thank you for allowing me to uh, dismiss myself a little bit early. Yes. Thank you again for joining us. Have a good night. Good thank night. You. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Um, okay. So I'm looking at our agenda. So, um, Allegra, I was going to say, yeah, if we could kind of move up the police chief and Crest director search update. Yep, let's move that up and the budget letter and then debrief. And I'm going to suggest we table clinical and support options for tonight yeah. because I think it's 830 and, you know, <laughs> you know. Oh. The energy level is starting to go down. Yeah. Um, so, Everell, do you have any updates about the police chief search? I, I do. And to the best that I can give um, information without compromise in the police chief search. So um, we met, our last meeting was um, last Wednesday and we started with um, 11 applicants. Um, and in our last meeting, what we did as a committee was we narrowed down that 11 to about five. So we are now inviting those five to first round interviews that will be conducted on Zoom. Um, we're in the process of working. To, um, we, we propose some times and dates for those interviews. And so the town staff um, has been very gracious and helpful in organizing those, um, those interviews. What we're doing now as a committee is we are working on questions that we want to ask um, our prospective police chief so um, I'm happy to take back questions from um, CSSJC. If there are any particular questions that um, you'd like to be asked on your behalf, I'm happy to do so. In terms of, um, I think we have very um, qualified candidates. Um, there were some people that were very, um, wrote very um, sensible, smart um, cover letters. Um, that address diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, there are some that spoke spoke specifically about um, healing, you know, creating racial harmony, given what the country has been through over the last few years. 
So that gave us in a window into um, our prospective candidates. Um, and so I think um, I, I, I think we have, um, I, I do have some concerns as to whether or not um, the pool is large enough, but we left the application open and we've gone back and reviewed um, prospective interests. And since we met in December, we haven't had um, anyone else applied. We've expanded the search to different um, um, social networks, so to speak, where you find um, police chief um, applicants. And we haven't had um, that many. We actually lost one person who actually accepted um, a chief police search in a different state. And so they withdrew because they accepted another job um, almost right away. So um, we did reach out to the remaining ones to, to engage that they're still interested in and should be considered. And they did say yes. So that is why we're moving forward with interviews as quickly as we can. Um, not necessarily trying to hire somebody as a placeholder, but making sure that we at least have qualified candidates that we know will address and meet the needs of the town. Um, can can I ask some questions? Yes. Um, you know, obviously I understand that it's a search and obviously there's certain confidentiality aspects to it, but I guess for me, like you said, I mean, this is a very important um, hire. Um, of course, we want to get someone in there as soon as possible because, you know, that's what the the community deserves. However, we need to make sure that, yeah, that we have a good, healthy pool with, you know, diverse, um, you know, applicants and everything. So, I mean, without you going into specifics, um, do these five kind of present, you know, some type of diversity in terms of everything, not just diversity in terms of the, 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 the root sense of it, but in terms of ideas and, and so on and so forth. Like for me, when you say about asking questions, it would be, you know, and I've, I've always been clear, like do you have an anti-racist philosophy and what does that mean, you know? So that would be a question. So would these five be able to, you know, be strong in regards to, 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 to that type? So that's what I mean by a healthy pool. I, I would say yes. I think there are some that are stronger than others. Um, having been on this committee and understanding the needs of a town, I would say that there are some that are stronger than others. And one of the things that the committee has done, we've been very open and vocal about it. We actually had a two hour meeting where we literally walked through every single person's cover letter resume and had those kind of very point in conversations to say, is this person right for the town and do they carry what we are looking for um, as a committee and as a town? So um, yes, there is diversity. Um, some people I think have more than others. Um, I can say though, um, one of the things, and, and this is through no fault of the town, um, was that we had no female applicants. I was a little bit disappointed about that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. But but you did say though that the application is still open. Yes. Hopefully there's still outreach and hopefully, you know, that they could still be kind of um, you know, recruiting uh, you know, to, to some organizations or institutions or places that could have um, you know, candidates that that would be more diverse, including females, um, that could possibly apply for this position. Yeah, so it, it is going to stay open until we actually say, um, quote unquote, fill the position. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing, do you know like what the process is going to be? So you do these first round interviews, then do you know what the next step is and so on and so forth? Or Yes. So we interview um, the five. And if we like any of the five, we schedule a second interview for those, and then we recommend three to um, town manager. And then th those three, after the second round of interview, would be invited to in-person interview with the town manager.
Okay, and so and and the town and the town manager has not um opened it up to have kind of public forums with the three finalists with um the community. I I don't think that's going to happen. I think that is the intent of this committee, and I can tell you that the town manager is not part of the committee at all. Mm -hmm. Um. So he's not involved in any stage of this. Um, he's removed himself from it. Um, there are quite a few people from diverse backgrounds on this panel um, that is making this decision. And I think he's trusting that collectively. I think there is either eight or nine of us. Um, and he's not even, um, he's only been to the first meeting to introduce the panel to each other. But other than that, he hasn't been involved in the process. He's removing himself until we actually decide collectively and send him those um, names for his consideration. Yeah, so that so he's doing you know kind of really traditional kind of search process as opposed to you know what the community has been saying, which is involve us in in the process, right, and make sure that we're also asking um, these questions of these candidates. So, all right. Thank you. You're welcome. Lisette, do you have anything to add or ask? Not at this time. Okay. Um, so I guess briefly about the Crest Director search. Um, so let's see, in December, because we didn't meet last month, in December, we had a similar process of the seven or so of us who are involved in the search committee. We met with human resources and the town manager first, um, and then we met without the town manager to discuss the applicant pool. Um, and we had, I want to say, at least 19 come in. And we had first round interviews with eight people. Um, of those eight, we suggested four to the town manager. It was my understanding that there was going to be a second smaller team that was going to meet with the town manager with the four applicants. Um, and then that there would be meet and greet opportunities for the candidates with the Crest responders. Um, I read today on, I believe it was the Amherst Current website that those interviews have happened and there was meet and greets with the leadership team, but it didn't mention whether there were leaders or meet and greets with the Crest responders. I did send an email um, and I mistakenly had sent it and not included the human resources director on the list. So it was everybody on the search team, but the person who had the answer to the question. So I don't have an answer to whether the Crest responders met with the candidates or not. Um, but it was my understanding that was supposed to be part of the process. And so it sounds like from what Pamela is saying that they intend to have somebody hired to start by mid to late March. Um, so... And from from your understanding, the four that that you all are sent to, I guess the the next smaller group um, were strong candidates. Um, in terms of the same question I asked, uh, Evro. Yes, I think that there was definitely diversity of experience, lived experience, professional experience, um, diversity of thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there were both female and male candidates in the pool. Am I allowed to say that? I don't know. Um, and that's not giving out any. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think that hopefully there will be people who are able to carry this work forward, whoever mm -hmm. it ends up being. Um, and um, for me, also, what I'm interested in, especially with Crest, given what happened with Earl, is someone that um, is able to feel that they're empowered mm -hmm. to, you know, to to push through the vision of Crest as envisioned by CSWG. So 
So someone that's going to be able to be, um, you know, feel strong to, to do that, um, given some of the town's resistance, mm -hmm. to, you know, the feedback that they've been getting. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think like those four, there would be people there that could, that could do that? I do. Okay. Okay. Well, that's good. That gives me some hope. Hope is the last thing to die. Right. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. So that's that. Mm -hmm. Did you, if, if I may ask one question, um, mm -hmm. did you get a sense that, um, and, and I know they're potentially all good candidates, um, but did you get a sense that um, if there needs to be pushback against the town, they would be comfortable doing so, like in terms of being stark defenders of um, Cress's original core mission? I think that certainly there are some that would be stronger at that than others. And I think that, um, I think that there were some who had a better understanding of the town itself um and the other you know the history of Cress as opposed to coming in kind of with less of the history um and understanding of the town's culture um, so. makes sense thank you say um all right let's let me i'm gonna share my screen and put up the budget letter i think in light of some of the conversation and some of the questions that were asked by the public i'd like to look over this and if we agree to send it send it asap so that at least the town has on record that we made some recommendations about what we would like to see with the budget for a cross um can everybody see that? Yes, I can see. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so this is the letter that we had started to look at back in December. So obviously I would change that. Um, February. All right. Um, how do you, do you want me to read this out loud? How do you guys want me to do this? Well, I, we read it. I read it wasn't, it. yeah. Can, can I, on, on the very first um, paragraph, mm -hmm. uh, can that be referred to say the, the Community Safety and Social Justice Committee reaffirms its support as opposed to would like to? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I think I started with two paragraphs. Is it in the packet? Where did I see it? It was in the packet. Um, and now that I'm just looking at part of this and looking at um, and thinking about what we talked about, I think right here talking about CSSJC is advocating for reworking the program assistant position. I think it needs to be into an assistant director position and a pro an administrative assistant position. Does that Yeah, that's a minimum. But like I said, I think, you know, and and Ms. Pat said it too, in terms of like shift supervisors, 
so that then we have it be staffed like 24 seven, but. In, in, in light of today's conversations, um, does it make sense? Because um, does it make sense to say, rather than advocating for a real work in the program assistant, we just flat out ask for an assistant director because I could see a opposition from the union to say to, to Deborah's earlier point, you're taking away um, a union position. So in an effort to like mitigate, so to speak, that kind of pushback um, rather than, you know, quote unquote, taking away position, we just say um, from what we've seen, the department is best served with an assistant director position being created for continuity um, in the event like something like this happens again. And I think they also said that we lost AmeriCorps. Oh yeah, I wanted to ask about that. No, we. Well, yeah, as we know, the DEI is is severely under understaffed and underfunded. Well, clearly, it was not a sustainable solution. Um, I'm sorry. I'm just going to take that sentence out. Mm -hmm. Changes, questions, comments, concerns. I think there was, I think those were my, um, my, my only, um, concerns. I think in public comments, um, I think it was Miss Pat. Um, I think she mentioned something to the effect of um, racial healing. I, I would suggest adding something to the multicultural center paragraph to say, you know, that is a step towards, um, I, know, I know it says unifying cultural resources, um, but I'll also go um, further and add that this is, this is a step towards racial healing and to show that Amher the town of Amherst is committed to racial healing.
those are my comments. Do we want to use the word commit? And um, fair. Commit to what? I guess, well, I'm struggling with the wording. Um, like Which paragraph? Commitment, you're saying? Yes, like, would, I mean, demonstrates. Yeah, would demonstrate Amherst's commitment. To yeah. Thank you. Racial equity, I don't know, racial. Um, okay. So we changed the wording to be more straightforward in the first paragraph to just say reaffirms its support, advocating for an assistant director position, and an administrative assistant position, um, needing more money for DEI without talking about AmeriCorps, which no longer is operating in DEI and press, and drawing together multicultural center and racial healing. So those are the changes that have been made. That's good to me. Right. Do we have to take an official vote on that, on this? I think so. Okay. So if somebody moves that this letter be sent to the town council, somebody could then second it and then we could vote. So moved. Thank you, Avril. Is there a second? Can we even I, take it? Because we're chairs, right? We can't. So, <laughs> so let's say you have to... <laughs> I second that motion. All right. So we will take a vote. And the vote is to send this document to the town council and town manager. Um, Avril. Aye. Lisette. Aye. Deborah. Yes. And I am a yes. It passes, send budget letter. Um, okay. I'm going to make sure I'm saving it. I'm going to stop screen sharing. All right. Save. Um, so the last item on our agenda for now is the debrief from the forums. And there are three things noted, communications, feedback, civil rights, violation, feedback, and community outreach efforts. The forums feel like a really long time ago right now. Um, I want to say that the communications feedback was mostly around um, actually communicating the physical location of Cress and what the hours were and that kind of stuff. We heard some confusion from community members um, around that. So that should be more clear. I'm also wondering if that and an outreach plan really need to be discussed with members of the Cress leadership team now that I'm thinking about it. Well, I think I think we can discuss it with them next time, but I think it's not a bad thing for us to talk amongst ourselves. Oh. That we can order kind of like what's the priority to bring up to them because yeah. as we see, it's kind of like we need to be very back, you know, focused with them and stuff. Mm -hmm. So um I think it's not a bad idea to have this um conversation. But yeah, as I remember it too, in terms of the communications feedback, it was around kind of like the hours. Um sometimes um the 
kind of the office, especially around Crest, not feeling like it's, you know, open to the public and things like that, kind of having, you know, that type of, not necessarily a barrier, but in, you know, in known, you know, in that kind of way, like not feeling like it's open for them to be able to access the responders, right? And then some people still saying Banks Community Center is not as accessible um, because of like, you know, closed doors and, and different things. So um, I think, you know, um, I remember getting a lot of that feedback around, you know, communication. Um, and then also like, I had heard to just, you know, more information about Crest, right? About the responders, about what the responders do, um, you know, how you can access them because now there's two ways, right? In terms of dispatch and a phone number. And that had been something that CSWG had also kind of, you know, when the first rollout was coming out, it was to say, yes, you need to really advertise you know, about the responders and how people can have access to them. Um, so I think we, we heard a lot of that in the feedback. Um, so I, I think um, in, in terms of advertising, have we done any like mailers to like every home in Amherst? Like, can we, can we look into doing that? Just like because I'm, I'm pretty sure I got a an application to register to vote by mail, and I think it was postage paid. Uh, so I, I think the town has the capacity to for us to create some kind of flyer that um, introduces the entire town to Cress, and we can just drop in everyone's mailbox, utilize the postal service. Yeah. I think that's a good idea. And I, I, I think um, that I think you're frozen, Allegra. Okay. I couldn't tell if you were frozen, so it must have been me. Um, I think that's a good idea. And I think that there's also times like, and I think it just passed where they sent out the census, but I think that they've done things like coupled up a, a townwide flyer in like the census or in your water bill or in, you know, and obviously that wouldn't necessarily reach like renters households. So I think looking at doing just like an every door direct type mailing. Um, or, or even that newspaper that comes out. Yeah. The reminder. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think like one of the things, and I think someone had brought that up I, and I at, at one of our um, community forums that when there was a gap, right? So so remember, because CSWG, even though we had asked the town manager to keep us in place until our recommendations were put into place, he disbanded us. And then, you know, and then, you know, of course we, we created the charge for CSSJC. But then there was that that point in the middle when there was no one, there was an implementation team, but there wasn't any kind of group monitoring things. And so during that gap, we were not communicated about a lot of things. And part of it was around the advertisement and things like that. So a lot of things fell through the cracks during that time. And I think advertising for Crest. So what I remember Earl doing a lot of was out, you know, going to places and stuff. And but in terms of actually advertisement, putting it out there, which was one of the things that I was always, you know, talking about when I was CS, at CS at uh, WG. And I know I would have been kind of, you know, pressuring for, for those things to happen. That didn't happen. And of course, Earl had to pick his battles, right? It's not, he was new and stuff like that. So it's not like he could be like, hey, I, I want this, you know, money to be spent this way and that way and the other. But that could have been something that if there was a group in place, we could have kind of, you know, talked about. So... So I think that that's something that we need to kind of bring bring up again because the community feedback from our forums brought that up. I would also suggest that um, we we are in an election year and a lot of people will be doing early voting, so maybe have like um, large size enough placards in every polling voting place um, with crests um, visible. Because a lot of the older people will do their go in early and vote. Um, 
So that's another way we can get the message out as well. Um, and again, this is a this is a town department, so put it in every town space, yeah, you know, that people are voting. And I, I also don't think it would be um, far fetched when people are voted and are walked now, so they're handed a flyer about Crest. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think this year, as or 2023 and previous in 2022, they were serving as constables in the um, voting location. So rather than having a police officer there, they the Crest responders were actually there at the at some of the locations at least i know i saw one at mine i think during the school vote but and in terms of community outreach efforts cuz i i want to say in at the in person meeting there was some talk about doing some outreach in specific apartment complexes um and i think lisette you had talked about doing some outreach in one of them or or helping at least connect somebody to do the outreach in in the complex yes so it was actually harder than i thought it would be um but we do have local bus stops um, and actually some flyers were put on for the oversight board. Mm -hmm. Um, but that was actually a little bit difficult considering that there was three different flyers for English, Spanish, and I believe, uh, Mandarin or Chinese. Um, I believe, well, I placed some in laundromats because mm -hmm. I think that those are areas where a lot of people, I don't know, go to um so bus stops and laundromats um so i can do the same for any crest advertising yeah and then i think the other one too was just for us to to hold uh forums in some of the um apartment complexes um next time to kind of go to where the community is at so i think the next time we plan forms, maybe if we plan some for the springtime, um, we should think about that. No, um, I know Olympia Oaks has like a community room and then the University Village Apartments has a community room. Um, there was one other apartment complex that I was thinking of, but now I can't remember what it was. Um, but some of them have like spaces for gathering and then there's, you know, I know Rolling Green, I think has a pretty active person there that will send out like an email to the community to say, you know, these are some things happening or here's information about this or that, so. Um, yeah, I'm but, thinking like, um, you know, when we think about doing our next um, community forums, we can just work with uh, Jennifer. I think she'll she'll have a good idea. Yeah. You know, like, but you're right, you know, it'd be for us to go and um, meet at, in their different like community rooms mm -hmm. um, and, you know, be able to hold forums there. Um, maybe we can add that to the agenda, Allegra, like our, when when we think we want to do our next town forum, when it makes sense. And these would be in the community, so we'd be going there because, you know, the feedback we got is that, yeah, some um, people don't feel safe going to, like we had it at the town hall, there's a lot of people that don't feel safe going into that building, you know. So if you want to get different voices, we want to go to the community. Obviously, bring food because that gets people out. Oh, yeah, definitely food and some coffee and tea and juice and things like that. I mean, obviously, the other thing, too, and this is just 
between us, like when we do our next town forms, is just make sure we have kind of a plan, a note taker, because I think that that was a little bit discombobulated, you know, like when we should arrive, you know, all of those things, because I felt like the in-person one, we were scrambling a bit. And then, um, well, are we done talking about the community outreach efforts? I don't have anything to add. Because then there was the other, um, the civil rights violation feedback. I wonder, um... I wonder if it would be worth reaching out to the Human Rights Commission and um, seeing if that's something we'd want to have like a joint meeting about because I do feel like it's bigger mm -hmm. than us and bigger than. And did everyone see um, the the comment? I don't know if we shared that with everyone, Allegra, about the. Civil rights. We could also add it to our next meeting. Yeah, I, I do feel like that's a big. Yeah, that's a, a bigger discussion. Discussion. I mean, I think it's really important and I think that do do we uh, this is a question for Pamela I think did we have a sense of when the report about Rob was going to be due she said March March because mm -hmm. I think one of the suggestions was about whether that would slide into the scope of Rob, for lack of a better word, um, or if it would be a separate committee. Well, yeah, I think it would be. It was a separate board. Um, yeah. Because um, but but the the person was saying like like board like um, the you know like um Rob, it would be an oversight board, but now a civil rights oversight board um, to really look at, you know, like the, like the July 5th incident mm -hmm. or, you know, some of, you know, the incidents that happened in the middle school, you know, that, that, that board would capture some of those because right now, even the human rights commission, they're not able to really, they're not empowered to um, make kind of recommendations. So that this board would have like investigatory and recommendation uh, power um, yeah. so that's why, you know, maybe it does make sense for us to kind of maybe share what the community person shared, right. Yeah. With the rest of our group. And then, um, we could put it on to, for us to kind of talk among ourselves first and then maybe invite human rights commission. Okay. One of our meetings to kind of discuss it. it, it and they wouldn't have to like attend our whole meeting. Maybe we could just have them, you know, just, um, be part of our meeting in the beginning just to discuss that portion or whatever other portion we want them to discuss, you know? Right. I think that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, and I am just flagging it in my email so that I will include that comment in the packet for our next meeting. Cause I think, I think having some time to kind of digest what was said and Mm -hmm. think about how that can come to fruition what you know whether it would be us recommending you know again recommending to the town council that this become a thing and coming up with a charge for it and everything and um is that is the police union contract um public document it is okay because um where where could we find that I believe on the town website, there is all of, it has um, a section with all the, um, why can't I talk, all of the um, finalized contracts 
for any bargaining units. I, I can search. I'm, I'm just thinking out loud. As yeah. We talk about um, subpoena powers. It'd mm -hmm. be interesting to see what the agreement is when an officer, quote unquote, may be brought before an oversight committee. Because mm -hmm. that could be the town's big hesitation and argument for why there's no subpoena powers. Because I do think that if there are no subpoena powers, the oversight board is not going to be as powerful as it should be. Mm -hmm. Because then it's just um, essentially an advisory committee with no actual authority. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's always been like the the sticky point, the point, especially around resident oversight board. But again, I mean, I think we need to get to the point where the, to, to even kind of really discuss it. And like you said, look at the the bargaining, you know, look when they're going to be bargaining again, you know, those sort of things. But we're not even there, right? Because they're still at point A, gathering information around the resident, you know, the the necessity of a resident oversight board, which was things that CSWG did. But like you said, yeah, we need to, to discuss that and and see how we can get over that hurdle. So are we feeling like it would be a good idea to put the civil rights violation oversight board on the next agenda? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And then we'll share the comment with, with our, you know, group. Yeah. And then, and then we'll discuss it. And then maybe at the next one, then we'll, we'll invite the HRC. Yeah. Um, one of the uh, just the other thing that I mentioned when the uh, temporary crest team was uh, presenting because remember they're doing their recommendations we might want to think about whether we want to do some recommendations to um, as a group to the town manager and town council. I don't think that's a bad idea. I think that if I guess I'm just thinking about how limiting it is to have this. We can't communicate all together, you know, outside of meetings that are posted and whatnot. And I wonder if each of us came with a list for next time of stuff to put together. And I think, I think it was actually helpful tonight to have each of the team members of the leadership team present about like staffing, training, and actual operational stuff. So I don't know if we want to kind of mimic that in our, our recommendations, our recommendations mm -hmm. so that we're thinking like, okay, well, I think we're all on the same page with it, having more structured leadership and having the assistant director be a position. And, um, but there might be some things that one of us thinks of that the other doesn't. And again, I thought it was interesting that they they had their consent items, but then they were all kind of putting in their own recommendations. And I would like to see how that pans out in terms of like, how are you structuring that? Like, is there a Pamela page and a Chief Nelson page? Or is it like a topic and the different ways that each topic could go? I, I, am, I, am, I am concerned about that. Because yeah. if, you know, as, as, a, as a group, if they're cannot be uniform consensus, I think that's problematic because then it leaves um, <laughs> it leaves too many variations or options to adopt. Um, so I, I, I was concerned about that, that they could not uniformly submit one recommendation. They felt it was necessary to submit a joint recommendation, but at the same time, include their own individual recommendations. I think that's problematic. Yeah. Yeah, and it lo it, it loses a, a lot of its strength, right? When you when when you do recommendations like that, and also it it creates a lot of room for doubt, 
um, in terms of why there's only certain people that agree with this one or that one. So it weakens it, dilutes it, dilutes the recommendations. So I think, you know, I think that's why it would be important for us to send in our recommendations since usually we can find consensus and we can send one powerful message. But yeah, so we can, well, why don't we, Allegro, what do you think? What are the areas? So why don't people just come up with a list of recommendations that they would like and then for the next meeting? And then what are the, the what was all the, um, the categories that they presented on? So it was staffing, um training and dispatch right dispatch. Oh. and just i guess they said dispatch and operations but okay dispatch operations okay. well we can put like maybe we can say staffing training dispatch and then operation which kind of leaves it more kind of open ended yeah you know, if people want to bring up other things but yeah, for the next meeting, why don't we like folks that want to, you know, make, uh, for, you know, some recommendations, why don't we just come up with like, everybody comes up with their list and then we can share it at our meeting in terms of staffing, training, dispatch and operations. Chris. And then we can just put it, put it together. Do you want to have everybody send them in to one of us like a few days before so we can compile it for the packet or? We could, or they can send it to Jennifer and then she compiles it, you know? Because with Jennifer, it would be safer in terms of the whole public meeting stuff. <laughs> the, the second Wednesday in March is March 13th. That would be our next meeting? Yeah. Okay. So if we have things to Jennifer by March 8th, that's like the Friday before. And I think that gives her enough time to actually have it posted that I forgot to do during member reports. So I'm revisiting agenda item. When uh, Reese the mayor, the uh, town council president reached out. And I guess rather than each committee just automatically having a liaison, they're asking us if we still want somebody from the town council to be appointed as our committee liaison with the understanding that there might not be someone who volunteers for the job. <laughs> um, so the person would come to our meetings or watch a video of the meetings and be the one who gives a update to the town council during their meetings. If they are in attendance at our meetings, they are not supposed to actually participate in any discussion. Um, they are just there to observe. Maybe we can ask Frankie, given he was on this committee. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if we can choose. <laughs> I think yeah. but we can't okay. choose. They yeah. have to volunteer. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think it's a good idea for us to have one. Yeah. Because we're about transparency. Right. I I think it's it wouldn't hurt. <laughs> you know, I don't see a downside to it. I think um I think well, the only downside would be if we get someone that just goes back and and reports things that then we actually didn't say that would be too bad. that would be a downside but hopefully somebody who <laughs> is volunteering to be a liaison is doing so because they have an interest in what this committee is doing and they want to give an accurate representation <laughs> of, of of what's happening um so the council person has to volunteer I believe so I think I think they the 
the request to me was, do we want somebody to be appointed or do are we interested in having somebody serve as a liaison? Should there be someone interested in being the liaison? So maybe we can ask Frankie to volunteer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I agree. I, I think we should have someone that reminds the council that there is a CSSJC. Right. Yeah. Okay, so I will email Lynn back and say we would be interested, should somebody be interested in us. Yeah, because the way they put it, I just found it. So the purpose of this email is to clarify the role of non-voting council liaisons and to ask if you would like to request a liaison this year. Please note that upon request by town committee and advised by the governance organization and legislation committee, the town council will decide which committees will have liaisons and if a counselor is available and willing to be a liaison. So I will say, yes, we are interested. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, and then someone could outreach to Freke, see if he's interested. Or Alicia. Alicia doesn't get to talk. <laughs> oh yeah, that's true. No, 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. No, we want Alicia to talk. So <laughs> I take that back. Sorry, Alicia. <laughs> um, all right. I don't th I think we are done with our regularly scheduled agenda. Mm -hmm. And if there is nothing further that wasn't thought of before 24 hours, we can open up for the last public comment. Yes. All right. Um, if and okay, we have a hand up. Hello. Yes, I'm still hanging in here at uh, Martha Hanner in uh, South Amherst here, and I had a couple of things. First, when you were brainstorming about publicity, one source that I don't know if you've used in the past is sending an announcement as part of the principals or superintendents weekly newsletter that goes out to all parents of, of students. That would be a good way to advertise some forum that you thought was relevant. Uh, and I and I like the sets, uh, you know, putting putting notices in laundromats and uh, other such places. Too. I know we have that challenge with our Judy Brooks series of trying to uh, publicize it. Uh, notices in the in the library and its two branches is a good good uh, too. You know that the Jones Library has that one room if you come in the side entrance where they have posters and then places where there's piles of brochures you can take. Yeah. Okay, and then on the other subject, I have questions for Everald about the police chief. Uh, interviews and so on. If everyone's still listening, Eric, don't see your picture. But I mean, we had hoped that there would be some way for uh, the public to interact with candidates or something. If that's just not working out as being practical, my question would be whether there's a way to sort of have the your committee publicly solicit people to submit their questions that they would like to have you folks ask the candidates. Is that something that would would be a way of getting, you know, public input? I, I, I am not being rude, but I don't think I'm about to answer you. <laughs> but <laughs> during, during public comment, Martha, uh, us as a com as a committee, we're we're not allowed. Well, yes, yeah, you're not allowed to. That's sorry, sorry, yes, sorry. But, yes, you're but not. We'll yeah. definitely, but we're definitely listening, and you know, we'll take yes, it. Okay. Questions. Well, that that was uh, just uh, one one thought there, and one question I think in particular that I would love to see the the com your committee discussing is there their thoughts about CRESS, because it seems to me here we are selecting a new director of CRESS and a new police chief about the same time. And it seems to me it's absolutely crucial that the two need to work together. 
to, to make Kress successful. It really needs to have a police chief that um, feels open about Kress, thinks it's a good idea, doesn't feel threatened, is willing to work with his staff uh, to to make it them think that Kress is, is something reasonable and willing to work with Kress on, you know, cooperative uh, ride-alongs or however it takes to, uh, you know, integrate Kress better. So I feel that that's one of the more important things for your committee to be asking the candidates. So uh, understand that you won't answer for now, but anyway, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Martha. Very good points. Thank you, Martha. Yes. <laughs> I don't know if anybody else has public comment. I will give a few minutes. No, a, a minute. Oh, there we go. Miss Pat. Okay, I'll be real quick. Um, I want to thank CSSJC again. Um, so this time regarding upper funds, advocacy and support for my group, Black Business Association for Amherst Area last year. So, and also special thanks to Alicia Walker who kept reminding the town manager when upper funds will come onto the agenda. It seems like from listening to town council meeting on Monday, it looks like uh, upper funds will be on the agenda on uh, on um, Monday, the last Monday of this month. So please spread the word. We want residents to come out and push for um, Upper funds look you know, located to marginalized group in our town, including business groups. We have um, there is four point nine million dollars left. I I feel that at least half of that money should go to people who are really really impacted during COVID, meaning low income resident in this town who are still you know struggling, you know uh, BIPOC businesses. Uh, you know, who needs the money. Um, I listened to finance committee several weeks ago where they were talking, I believe it's last year, where they were talking about using the upper funds for road repair, road repair, when residents are still suffering. I have a couple announcements to make. Um, so my group, um, Black, Business, <clears throat> Black Business Association of MS Area, where going to be celebrating Black History Month. Uh, the flyers will be out sometime this weekend. It's going to be on Friday, February 23rd, from 5.30 to 8 p.m. at White Lion. So come out, support Black-owned business, White Lion. Um, White Lion is also a member of BBAA. So come out and hear what we have to offer. Please come, 5.30 to 8 p.m., February 23rd. Um, thank you, Deborah, for announcing the Judy Brooks conversation series, which um, three young BBA members will be speaking. So I hope uh, this will be a Zoom uh, gathering. Um, Debbie already uh, shared that at the beginning. Thank you for doing that. And by the way, I enjoyed listening to both of you co-chairs uh, last month when you did your presentation, that was excellent. And the last thing is, as I was listening to the Civil Rights Violation Committee uh, discussion, to me, I think the issue is not creating another committee. I think strengthening the ones that already exist. I honestly feel that this year is an opportunity to push for CSSJC to be included in the charter, charter review so that it will have more power to investigate complaints and you know, um, 
actually act on, on uh, um, whatever the decision is. I think our town should be very, very lucky that we have a committee like yours and it has not been, it has been underutilized. I think the focus should be getting it into charter. We have, we, and we have already some committee in our town that make their own decision. They don't have to go through anyone. I think CSSJC should be one of them. Thank you and good night. Keep up the good work. Thank, Thank you. you more public comments. Martha and Pat both have their hands up still, but I don't know if that's because they have not lowered them. Um, seeing nobody else raising their hand for public comment, I am going to <laughs> so it is 9.33 and this meeting of the CSSJC is adjourned. I have to do something to pause the recording. Bye. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Always a pleasure.